You can listen to The Professional Left wherever you get your podcasts, on Netroots Radio, or at our website, proleftpod.com, where you can also contribute to this podcast. There's a PayPal button at our website, or you can mail us a letter and or contribution at P.O. Box 9133, Springfield, Illinois, 62791. This is the podcast for February 26th, 2021. It's not safe for work. Recorded live from the world headquarters of the Cornfield Resistance, where we know where French fries really come from. It's Mr. Potato Head. It's the professional left with Drift Class and Blue Gal. Again, this is not safe for work. You should not be listening to this around sensitive <laughs> people or children or people who blush a lot or people who would ban you from Twitter for saying things like Mr. Potato Head Penises, things like that. So <laughs> just use common sense, people. They were just saying Potato Head on the box. They weren't making a judgment about gender. I I hate to defend Hasbro. I just hate being put in that position of defending Hasbro. Because okay? you're a Monopoly girl, you know. I so. don't care. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't care what they put on the potato head box, but everything's got to be, well, and this is, I think, one of the themes of our podcast is that's all the Republican Party is doing now is culture, culture war there's, shit 24-7. Yeah. There's nothing left. Yep. There's nothing left to fight over the the... Every single thing that has been on the Republican checklist, they've either already accomplished or has proven to be a complete catastrophe over and over again. Foreign Mm -hmm. policy is what? Lying us into the wrong war, fucking that war up, and then pretending you never heard of it. Uh, Economic policy are massive tax cuts, which lead to gargantuan deficits because they want to get rid of Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, which the Republican base doesn't want to get rid of. And then pretending that deficits are bad when Democrats are in office and they're okay when Republicans are in the office. Every I issue. really think on the back of those, and I know they go by direct deposit, but uh-huh. humor me for a minute. The, the, Biden the back checks. of those those survival checks, those yeah. disaster relief checks that mm-hmm. are going to come out, um, it should say Biden won in a free and fair election right yeah. above <laughs> right above the your endorsement you know, endorsement line on the yeah. check. You have yeah. to sign off on that. And I thought that about the 2009 checks too, that they should mm-hmm. have Barack Obama's face on them. Mm-hmm. That is the one thing that Trump got right, bragging all the time about what he did, even when it was a lie, you know, constantly. Everything he did was fantastic and everything anyone else did was a disaster. And he branded himself that way and got 79 million people brainwashed that way. Mm-hmm. But we Democrats are terrible at taking credit for the really good stuff we did. That Social Security you get every month, that's from Democrats. Yeah. That should have a picture of Franklin Roosevelt's smiling Franklin face. Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. 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 No, and all of those anyway. Republican governors and mayors who proudly stood in front of the giant Obama stimulus check. Right. And, and pointed at a bridge. Gi- check. And yes. pointed at a, at a hospital and said, I did this for you. Yeah, you did it with the money that Barack Obama gave you that the black man you can't stand are going to run against for the next eight years. Uh, but you can rely on your base being that fucking stupid. Stupid is not really the right word, though. It's, it's gullible. More, it's, it's, yeah. There's an off switch in their brain when it comes to acknowledging anything that is uncomfortable or untrue or – Inconvenient, which is why Mitch McConnell can say one thing on one day, the exact opposite on the next, the reverse of that on the third day, knowing that, you know, if this is just a poo-poo platter. Whichever mm-hmm. yeah. whichever message you want, you can have. And you can ignore everything else because we've taught our base to ignore anything that doesn't agree with, you know, their tummy today. So mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. and that's what really kind of galls me about the entire in, in a meta sense, the entire Republican Party, including our never Trump friends. Why don't you all just go away? <laughs> because you failed pretty comprehensively at everything, at everything. You suck at everything except hating people like me. That's all you're good at. And even the 4% of people inside who don't want Donald Trumpism to be the, the norm in their party won't go away. They just want to hang in there and maybe we'll get a foothold in the Democratic Party. We can get our shit done there. We acknowledge that all the shit's bad. Like That's the problem. We don't have a mechanism in this country. To just to discommendate people, to shame them, to turn our backs on them and say, you know what? We're not going to listen to you anymore. Anything that goes on Fox is just static in this house. We're not going to report on it. 
we're going to we're going to monitor it as one monitors a pandemic, but we're certainly not going to give it any oxygen anywhere. We're going to ignore you people, and we're going to treat you like the pariahs that you are. I have permission to read this really good Twitter stream, uh, Twitter thread, excuse me, mm-hmm. from Tony the Democrat. Tony the Democrat is the guy who uh, organized postcards to voters, mm-hmm. and he lives in Georgia. Uh, worked, you know, postcards for John Ossoff in the House race that he didn't win and then for the Senate race that he did win. And uh, he wrote this Twitter thread this week that was very moving. And I asked him if I could read it on our podcast. And he said, yes, very graciously. And it's about economics. I'll, I'll just preface it by saying it's about economics, but it takes a couple of turns that were quite unexpected. And uh, I think our listeners will really appreciate it. Tony, the Democrat, writes, I have two periods where I was out of work for 10 and 11 months, respectively. Grueling periods for me that saw my savings depleted each time. I suffered from what my primary care physician called situational depression. Each time I emerged employed in a great new job for which I was uniquely suited. Perfect fits. When I got a new job requiring me to move in 2013, I drove my 99 Camry from Dallas to Atlanta. It broke down on me in Louisiana. The repairs were easily triple the blue book value, and I was set to begin my new job before the work could be done. So I left it there with the keys and a verbal agreement to sell it to one of the mechanics for $300. I went to a dealership in Georgia as soon as I arrived and arranged for a loaner. I ended up buying a Kia Sorento, completely unplanned. All these years, I'd tell people I went from a Camry to a Sorento because I was living closer to family. My siblings each had spouses and little ones. If they visited me, I wanted a vehicle in which all could fit. I said it so many times over the years, I forgot something. Something I hadn't thought about since 2013, until a friend texted me a moment ago explaining how he just bought an SUV to carry his paintings and go camping. It suddenly hit me. The real reason I'd bought an SUV was because I was worried I'd lose my job again. Mm -hmm. I had been so close to experiencing homelessness twice that I reasoned an SUV could afford me some options if worse came to worse again. In other words, he thought he might have to live in his car. Yep. I just moved back across the country. There's always uncertainty. An SUV gave me a backup plan. I'd forgotten all about that. My new job in Georgia went really well, and I even negotiated a better one after several years. Pushing this SUV plan B further back in my memory. When it came back just moments ago, it really hit me how much has changed, how normal the idea of homelessness became for me, that I had contingency plans in mind, even as I was beginning a new chapter that should have been nothing but hopeful. The memory took me back and placed me where the dread and fear that were once regular companions visited again. I was overcome just for a bit. I had to share it somewhere as a way to process. I've been so lucky. I see how close we've been to calamity and everywhere around us, there are so many who were not lucky enough. It's humbling. And it fuels me. It's another reminder why I do what I do with postcards to voters. And then this is his final uh, two tweets. What's keeping you going? What fuels your ongoing activism? From where do you find strength to keep fighting? I'm grateful to have this channel and to have so many kindred spirits working together for good. Thank you for all you're doing to keep people from resorting to their plan B's and making things better one election at a time. Mm -hmm. We're in the business of building hope because optimism is the best usher to the future. We encourage voting because each ballot is a hopeful act. 
right on because there is always hope right on. Yeah. And, you know, Amen. Postcards to Voters isn't the only or even the greatest form of activism out there. It's something that a lot of us do. And, uh, you know, there is no substitute for knocking on doors also, except if you can't get out and do that. And mm-hmm. uh, these Postcards to Voters have been a way of reaching out. Uh, both during a pandemic and also reaching every single voter, including those that work odd hours. And uh, it's it's just, it's been a great thing. And it has flipped some seats and made some changes. And then there have been times where that particular Democrat hasn't won. Um, but I, I th- do think about John Ossoff and how we wrote postcards for John Ossoff and he didn't win. And then, of course, his and then you gave name up. recognition. You all and gave his, up and... That, yeah, that, that it's it's hopeless. He said, "That's it. It's over. I never yeah. have to do this again." Yeah. No, no, he he grew from the experience, and we all did. And Georgia changed, and he ran for statewide office, and now he's a senator, and uh, he's the chairman of the committee where uh, Ron Johnson sits there, <laughs> <laughs> reads Russian propaganda out yeah. loud. So we're, we're sorry we did that to you, Mister. Yeah, we're sorry we did that Mr. to Ross you, John. Ross. Ross. Yeah, it's really sorry. <laughs> But quickly connected to that is um, one of the things I had to write about or in my reading for Lent this week was about poverty. And I know mm-hmm. I had a chat with you about this. Yeah. Uh, the reading was about the disciples giving up everything and following Jesus. And what does that really mean? And one of the things that uh, came out of thinking about that was the belief that losing one's privileges can often teach one empathy. We, there are fables and stories about that throughout history. Mm-hmm. Um, but this week there was a really good story <laughs> about how too many privileges teaches stupidity. <laughs> um, all of these Republicans bragging about having low minimum wages at their first jobs and uh, John Thune being the one example, Senator John Thune saying, I had, I made $6 an hour minimum wage in the late 70s. It was great. I thought I was rich. Uh-huh. And uh, people doing the math and realizing, you know, that's $24 an hour in today's dollars, John. Oh, oh. <laughs> Shh, no math. I was told there'd be no math. Yeah. You know, inflation, how does it work? Yeah. But I think we really need to do this minimum wage thing backwards rather yep. than forwards, which is John Thune today, if you were making that $6 an hour, it would be under $1.81 an hour. Yeah. And how do you live on that? How do you live on $1.81 an hour? Because that's, that is the math. Mm-hmm. What you were making $6 an hour, probably living at home, probably a student, uh, you know, not Depending on that, for the roof over your head, a dollar eighty-one an hour. Uh, this minimum wage thing is about economic justice in certain states, where they have decided that working single moms shouldn't exist. Yeah. Well, first of all, you, you know, know John Thune was making money on the side selling weed to high school kids. <laughs> you, you just you just have to know that that's part, that was part of his his income stream. But yeah, the idea that the people who are you are dooming to live on what you think is a fair floor mm-hmm. um, uh, don't exist in your world. Yeah, they, you yeah. just you just mind wipe them away. They they're they're irrelevant. They don't they don't certainly don't vote for you. And why worry about them? They're they're out of sight, out of mind. Um, and it, and it yes, and yet this minimum wage increase to fifteen is universally popular. Yeah. With of voters of every stripe. Of course it is. And and so – but this is one more of those sort of muscle memories of being an asshole Republican that they just can't get rid of. Tax mm-hmm. cuts will pay for themselves. Every single fucking economist on planet Earth says that's absolutely not true and it creates deficits and it's bad and it it, it creates all the worst incentives. You don't reinvest in your company. That's because, the problem. Yeah, Because, you know, because – you just take you're just leeching money out of the system and you're buying you know a million islands and and sending your car into space you don't reinvest in your organization because there's no incentive to do that and and yet they keep saying it over and over again this is really the kind of cargo cult approach to everything which is 
you know, you, the, the, you know, the story of the cargo cults, right? The, the, the aircrafts during World War II, they built landing strips on islands in the, in the Pacific Ocean. The natives saw a plane come down. They saw the landing strip. Suddenly they have their, their economic condition is improved because these people coming from God knows where are bringing all these cool things and then they're gone. Mm -hmm. And they start building bamboo planes to invoke the sky gods to come back down <laughs> because that's what happens. And, and that, you know, there might be some apocryphal stuff there, but as a, as a fable, it, it tells a really good story, which is there is this muscle memory buried deep in the dark, greedy, vicious little heart of every conservative that truly believes that unless you kick people who are poor hard and harder and harder, they're going to get lazy and, and steal your money. They're going to come into your house whereas, and steal your Whereas a CEO has to be paid a maximum wage. Sure. Or he'll go someplace else. Yeah, he'll go someplace so, else. And, and yeah. he needs and, – and signing bonuses for doing nothing for the first year are fine. And tax cuts to, to lure that person into your town are fine. Throwing money at rich people is perfectly okay and a great mm -hmm. incentive system. But for poor people, you just need to beat them harder. You just need to kick them harder. And that is true for every Republican policy. It's all shit. All of their policies are shit, which is like we said before, there's nothing left for them but culture war nonsense, which mm -hmm. is why this that's what they do. And I got to say, Tony, the Democrats story reminded me a little bit of um, I, you know, you and I have been on the economic roller coaster a few times. Yes, we have. And I was reminded of a job I took when I lived, you know, down here in Springfield. I was a grant writer. Mm -hmm. I had an office. I had a phone. Um, I liked the work I did. Um, it was a little hectic and the organization was was confused. But and you got me a lovely little um cartoon in a frame that mm -hmm. that you mm -hmm. know made a joke about being a grant writer, which was a very rare piece of art mm -hmm. to find for your <laughs> husband who was doing that. And grant writing was like my twelfth tier responsibility on my previous job. It was not mm -hmm. anywhere near my top, but I'm good at it. I'm good at lots of things. And I remember I never committed to the office. I never mm -hmm. drove a nail into the wall. I never hung a picture. I never yeah. did anything because I knew I could I could be asked to pack my shit up and go tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And there was no point in getting comfortable because everything is temporary and I could just well, go on Well, and tomorrow. particularly when you work in the nonprofit world, which that Absolutely. job was. And the guy yeah. next to me, um, a nice guy uh, who, who, who suddenly shocked his Republican Party is full of Republicans. Um, but, you know, I still see him around town. He had you know, fully decked his office out. He says, no, he'd been there for years and he, everything was rolled out. He clearly lived in his office. Here mm -hmm. are the paintings and here's my artwork and here's my stereo and here's my – it just – he was very much at home there. And he had to go too. And yeah. suddenly he had to he, – he's like, what? And he had to pack his shit up. And I, I tell you, the, the first thing I bring to me on any job is our banker's boxes. Yeah. Because I yeah. know – I know that I'm not going to be there very long. Yeah. And I don't, I don't let that reflect itself in my work. I do good work. I always get good reviews. And when I have a job, it, it always goes really well. But it's just, it is a thing that gets in your head mm -hmm. that, you know what? All this can be taken away tomorrow. Yeah. So get ready for it. Have a plan B. Get ready for the thing. Get ready for everything to be taken away because that's the way the world is. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. not losing hope in the face of that, but saying there's got to be a better way. There's got to be a more perfect union you know yeah. where we can yeah. we can make people who who are not as privileged as you and i don't have don't have the resources oh you yeah and I do. no seriously um, not have to worry about just feeding their kids every day there's or got to buy be a, a car way. based on i might have to live in it someday right. and that's actually a thought you have in your head when you buy a car yeah mm -hmm. yeah now i have a question sure how do we transition from that very serious talk to cpac <laughs> <laughs> because I, yeah, other than CPAC I think, with I think, their gold, well, you know the golden the golden Trump is yeah. is a is a good transition, I think. Stay, stay golden, phony boy. So yeah, um, yeah. The, at the other end of the empathy spectrum, right? Um, at, at a there you go. Of, Congratulations, you did it. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. Just give me a minute. I, I will word. I can. I can wordsmith idea smith a whole bunch of stuff. Um, I have uh, several notes about CPAC. I'm not going to go into depth about it. I, 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 if you don't know what it is, it's the Conservative Political Action Committee. It's every year. It goes back you know, to pre-Reagan days, going back to the 70s, I think. And it's the gathering of the conservative true believers, the party, party, party people. Um, but it's also 
traditionally located uh, within a you know five ten minute drive of Washington D.C. because that's where the power is. So Except this year, well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Okay. <laughs> um, here's your CPAC pop quiz um, because there are people who remember CPAC as the as the civilized, nice place where you could bring your family and walk your dog and give your baby to a stranger and not worry about it, you know, being, you know, sacrificed. Um, so which CPAC person said of a prominent female Democrat, quote, all of politics is a conspiracy. Every campaign is a conspiracy. They want an enemy because in politics you need an enemy. She has slipped into the fever swamp and has developed a case of paranoia second to none. Well, that's about Hillary Clinton, no doubt about that's it. About Hillary that's about Hillary Clinton. It couldn't be about anybody else. Uh, from 1998. 1998. 1990, 1990. That was the that was the organizer. That was the head of the American Conservative Union, David Keene, uh, in 1998. Um, and prominent panels that year included the biggest Clinton scandals, TWA Flight 800, a transparent cover-up. Why is the FBI after me? And... <laughs> Wait a minute. There was a panel discussion on why the, yes. why is the FBI after yes. me? Yes, there the was. At the 1998 CPAC? There sure was. And Oy. finally, obstruction of justice, farce and fraud in the Foster investigation. Oh, my God. You remember Vince, Vince Foster, Foster, who was assassinated by Hillary oh Clinton? Oh, my God. That is, and that is that shit is so deep in their DNA. It's so wired into them that they they can quit the party. But they can't quit the the brain space that made them want to be part of this party. They can't stop hating liberals. I, I listen to a lot of conservative podcasts. I listen. I, I read a lot of newsletters because again, I monitor enemy transmissions. And and however sincere they are about how bad they feel that their party was suddenly went crazy, you know, four years ago. Who knew, who knew that was coming? They can't stop hating liberals. They can't stop. Every fucking time they turn around, there's some smart ass, snide, bitchy, vitriolic lie about the extreme left because that's the only way they prop themselves up. Even our friends. Yeah. Well, and I, I did note that in a, I did note that Dave Weigel had a tweet this morning. Mm hmm. 38 minutes into today's CPAC program. This is the opening day of CPAC Friday. Mm hmm. 38 minutes in, they aired. At their main stage, a Judicial Watch ad, and it's about holding Hillary Clinton responsible. We must hold her accountable in a world <laughs> where Hillary Clinton walks free. Yeah, no, this is this is who they are. And this Man. is who they've always been. And because we are liberal bloggers and podcasters, we have been writing about and, and focusing on, not focusing on, but aware of, in a critical sense, CPAC for decades. Oh, yeah. And from our perspective, from outside of the event horizon of crazy, uh, it's always been a freak show. It's always been horrible. It's always been mm -hmm. just a, a train wreck. But for people on the inside, even our Never Trump friends who remember CPAC is kind of half goofy with a sort of conservative Aspen Ideas Festival thrown in that was <laughs> that, that went suddenly insane in, in 2017. For no explicable reason. Well, the reason was Donald Trump. And that brings us to the last part of my little uh, diatribe here, which is the locations of seven of the past CPACs. Um, and not, not in order, uh, but along a timeline. And see if you notice the pattern. Uh, 1988, it was the Omnishore Hotel in Washington, D.C. In 1998, Arlington, Virginia. 2008, 2012, 2016, 2019, it was the National Harbor in Maryland. 2020, it was the Gaylord National Resort in Fort Washington, Maryland. It has always been located a short drive from Washington, D.C., because that's where the lobbyists are, and that's where the politicians are, and that is the center. That is the Mordor of conservatism. That is the center of power. But this year, it's being held in Orlando, Florida, mm -hmm. because Donald Trump is the center of the Republican Party. And they brought CPAC to him. To him. And yeah. that's all you really need yeah. to know. They are – it's it, – I am, yeah. I am kind of amused by the fact that. Um, well, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, speaking of things that don't belong, uh, <laughs> there's an ad for. May I, may I just say something in defense of CPAC before you go on? Sure. Which sure. is, Democrats have conventions like this too, and you were there in Chicago when. Yeah. I was. Yearly, it used to be yearly coasts, and that was in Chicago, and all of the candidates showed up it did. in 2008. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, as a candidate for him during presidential years, regardless, there are there are places, there's the state fair in Iowa, there's place things in New Hampshire, and there's things in Washington, D.C. where mm. candidates get a look-see, right? You, right? you go and you pledge fealty to the values and issues that matter to your base at these places. That I have no problem with. No. But – the fact is CPAC has no issues or values that they're no. talking about that matter. All you have to do now is come and pledge fealty to Trump, right? That's, That's it. it. That's it. Um, although I will notice that Ron DeSantis gave the keynote address this morning and it was seven minutes and he didn't mention Trump once. Well, you know. So. Uh, he's, he's coming, honey. Don't you worry. <laughs> um, he's on his way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Anyway, uh, the odd thing out because it's it's D.C., Maryland, Maryland, Virginia, and then boom, Florida. Well, you know what right. that means. It means, um, as I said, speaking of things that don't belong, lists where one of the things doesn't belong. There's an ad for the second annual Conservative Principles Summit, which sounds very high flown. It's basically the people who run the Lincoln Project and the Bulwark lumped together in a in a conference center trying to figure out the future of their party. I know what the future of your party is. It's dead, Jim. It's dead. It's over. Well, then, if the party's dead, how can we weasel our way to the Democratic Party and steer them in our direction? You know, because mm -hmm. we're basically a parasitic organism. We don't want to yeah. give up what we believe. We don't want to let liberals, you know, run wild. Um, but we can't acknowledge everything we believe is shit. So we need to find a home. And again, it's the sense of, why don't you just go away? You know, your party kicked you out we don't want you and there's nothing of value you have to offer to anyone go do something else but they can't they got to be part of they got to be in the conversation you know charlie sex was retired he came back in to to be whatever the fuck he is so now they're sponsoring the second conference uh called the conservative principle summit and i gotta say the ad for it is wild and the ad for it is why the, the reason it's wild is because it features several prominent voices. Uh, Condoleezza Rice, John McCain, Ronald Reagan, Bob Dole, Mitt Romney, George Bush, although George Bush is not pictured. Because who the George fuck wants- George W. Bush, George w. not Bush. George H. W. No. George, George H. W. Bush, w. Bush doesn't Bush. exist. There's no Nixon, right. there's no Eisenhower, that goddamn socialist, you know, Eisenhower. George W. Bush is voice only because nobody wants to remember George Bush. Mm -hmm. But the leadoff batter for this, this crew of Hardcore, true believing conservatives is a guy named Martin Luther King Jr. <laughs> and I just sat back and go, "Wow, this is how you're honoring Black Black History Month." I guess it's uh, pressing the late Dr. King into service to help you launch your snipe hunt for some set of principles that you can wrap some marketing material around. Because they are convinced that Martin Luther King would Martin Luther King Jr. would be a never Trump. MSNBC. Oh God, yeah. Mm -hmm. Talking about never Trumpism within the Republican Party. Yeah. No, he wouldn't. No. He would be on Moral Mondays, flailing all of them yeah. for destroying unions, cutting taxes for rich people, and what we have a seven twenty five minimum wage. Really? Yeah. Are you insane? What's <laughs> did, maybe the phrase "the poor people's campaign" hasn't sunk in yet because it's only yeah. been forty years? But yeah, that's no. You're not of my tribe. You're not of my people, and wow. you never will be. But the, and I'm just I, I I thought it was a parody because it's Ronald Reagan. Sure, for, it like, sounds like something The Daily Show would put together. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it you know, was and, Martin and Reagan, Luther King for Ronald Reagan. Yeah, for Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and and but again, all the people who were omitted from that list, <laughs> you know, a very long list of people who have made the Republican Party what it is today that they would much rather forget about mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. was just and I'm just. I I know they they are without they're they're in the wilderness they don't know what to do but they keep trying to attach themselves to other better people and organizations and ideas and take them over or steer them in their direction and I don't want them in my party I no no that's not true that's not true I will take any Republican former Republican who says look don't listen to me I I was a fucking idiot I got it all wrong I was I got it all wrong please get that microphone on my face go talk to Duncan Black. Go talk mm -hmm. to Digby Parson. Go talk to Nicole Sandler. Go talk to Bob Seska. Go talk to Stephanie Miller. 
they were not congenital fuck ups for the last 40 years. They actually got most of the stuff right. They fight among themselves, but they got most of it right. I have no business being on camera because I don't know what I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. And the reason mm -hmm. I can prove that is look at my long history. That's what they could do. And they could go off and vote and they could knock doors and they could do postcards to voters and they could talk about how important it is to support liberal institutions and liberal causes and liberal candidates because that's the only party that's sane. But they don't want to do that because that means to acknowledge that they've been wrong their entire life. Well, they got to give up their sub-zero freezers and their nice house in suburban Washington, D.C. Yeah. and their <laughs> vacation house on, you know, what Martha's Vineyard or wherever it is. My dude. And None of these people yeah. are ever going to live out of their SUV. No, they're already none of them. set for life. <laughs> yeah, but they really yeah. they don't want to be out of the spotlight. They don't want to be out yeah. of that. And if they have to invent a spotlight and and then make up their own awards to give themselves, they'll do mm -hmm. it. But mm -hmm. it, I'm not obliged to take them seriously. I take them seriously as a threat to my party because mm -hmm. I see them trying really hard to push us out of the way and become yeah. the steering mechanism on my party. And I. To whatever extent I have any authority to, to stop them, I certainly want to do that. Um, and a group of people who uh, did try to do that are having a very bad month. Um, they're called the Lincoln Project. No, oh, yeah. And I, I'm not going to talk about me and how right I was and how wrong you all were and how very right I was and how I predicted it all because that just sounds self-serving. And I certainly would never want to do that. But I will say that once you've lost Chris Saliza, yeah. you, you're pretty much <laughs> toast. <laughs> so – so how did they lose Chris Saliza? Well, he noticed that they were uh, doing shit that they shouldn't do. Um, <laughs> well, and here's the thing: he like because Chris Saliza is a complete hack. <laughs> complete. Yeah. We won't do a whole show on Chris Saliza, but Chris Saliza is is the ass the ass end of hack. And but he's got a job at CNN. He's got a, a column, I believe, in the Washington Post. He's set for life. No one's going to touch Chris Saliza. But he's just about sitting on the porch observing what everyone else noticed what climbs up onto ago. his porch right. and what, what finally became so obvious that chris Saliza had to sit up and take notice yeah was that the lincoln project was probably not a good idea to keep going yeah, yeah. it finally got to be safe enough for chris to snipe at them from cover without fear of retribution exactly. and he, then he decided to right. do that yeah. and yeah. lo and behold politico wrote a thing and it looks like there might not be a future for them and I don't think that's unfortunate because I don't think they did any good in the last election. But so are they hitching their wagon to Bill Crystal and just moving on to Bulwark stuff? Is uh, that what they're going to do? They're they're two halves of the same coin. They're joined at the hip to this other these other group of media never Trumpers who've all been vouching mm -hmm. for each other this whole time. Right, they've all been. You know, everyone's got their arm around everyone else, and it's year zero every time. Yeah. And now I'm just losing my, my words, so I'll stop talking well, about it. Well, Karen Tolmuty has a new book out praising she Nancy does. Reagan and Ronald Reagan. She does. And you know how I know about that? You read, you heard about it on the Bulwark, it was podcast. The Bulwark podcast. I know you did. Yes. <laughs> uh, where she and Chris Sykes, uh, Charlie Sykes, took turns singing Hosannas to St. Ronald Reagan and sighing about the good old days and poo-pooing the suggestion that there's any continuum at all that would ever link a, a, a glorious, sunny, upbeat not at all racist person like Ronald Reagan hmm. with Donald Trump. It's like they're in two different universes. And I would, two words, Drift Glass, yeah. Philadelphia, Mississippi. Two words, Blue Gal, Rick Perlstein. Yeah. yeah. I would love to have Karen and Rick sit down with a steel cage death match and have yeah. him just disassemble her pretentious rewriting, whitewashing of the Reagan history with mm -hmm. his massive knowledge of what yeah. it really was like and how things of really Republican got to be the way history. Are. Yeah. And and not just Reagan the president, but yeah. Reagan all the way back. Yeah. Reagan the man. Yeah. And and the Reagan as he I, I heard him on I think the Nicole Sandler show a couple of days ago saying, you know, the one guy who who held on to Nixon to the very end and said Watergate wasn't such a big deal was Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan. And it yep. paid dividends because if you're if you're absolutely dog loyal to the leadership Eventually, you'll be rewarded. And that's what all Republicans understand. If you're mm -hmm. just dog loyal to the lead sled dog, like Mitch McConnell is to Donald Trump. Exactly. And eventually, yes. it'll pay off. You just, if you all stick together, it, it'll all pay off. Yep. And he hasn't changed one iota. He'll back Donald Trump if he's the nominee. He's he's right back on the on the chain gang of we're going to support Trump to the end. Yep. Um, there was a... a an important anniversary passed this this last week, Blue Gal. I don't know if you know about it. No. 
uh, because nobody knows about it, because nobody cares. It's the 12th anniversary of the tea party, the fake tea party. You mean yeah. Glenn Beck's Tea Party with Fox News advertising? That, the that very one, one. The, the the one that had, was going to reshape American politics. That that not at all astroturfed, but purely grassroots movement of just patriotic, ordinary, homespun, God fearing Americans who certainly weren't Republicans looking for a way out of the heinous shit they'd done for twelve years. Um, and they just sprang up spontaneously. Um, two thousand and nine, two thousand nine, two thousand right? ten. Yeah, um, yeah. And this last couple of weeks, uh, other than Bill Sher, who's a, a friend of the pod, mm-hmm. um, doing real yeoman's work to warn us that the forces that created the fake Tea Party are still with us. Nobody, well, and the forces that hid the fact right. until years later, multiple years later, mm-hmm. that when we polled all these Tea Partiers, it turns out they're all Republican base voters. Yeah. And the yeah. mainstream, you know, the the non Fox media didn't announce that it's it's like you know they they didn't have any pollsters or any people to ask or yeah. any way to check or any way to look at things. They could they just couldn't check out voters. You know that wasn't possible to ask voters about who they voted for in the past. No, it couldn't be. <laughs> it, it's unknowable. It's utterly unknowable. And uh-huh. the fact that you know, their, their faded Bush Cheney bumper stickers are still in their car wasn't a, apparently a dead giveaway. Because right, now they're wearing right. a tricorn hat and waving a Gadsden flag. So their whole new, brand new political movement yeah. fr- sprung from the ground with with no uh, help from anybody. No, right. just out of no. Now, over at, there's a small Trump, re- uh, never Trump revisionist factory you mm-hmm. might have heard of called The Bulwark, um, <laughs> where Matt Lewis wrote the only other column I could find on the, on the Tea Party. And he wanted to be very clear that he long argued that there was a straight line between the Tea Party and MAGA. And <laughs> and yes, he was one of the wise early visionaries who, who was, oh, and Charlie Sykes, you know, wanted to weigh in that, you know, yeah, you know, there was a time, Matt, there was a time back when CPAC was a great place to raise your kids, Matt. Oh, yeah, there was. And back when Matt Schlapp was a real man, she was a real good guy, Matt Schlapp. Oh, but what happened to good old Matt? And back when Rush Limbaugh was You mean fun, Matt Schlapp, who was part of the um, Brooks Brothers riot? Yes, that, that very guy? same Matt Schlapp. But let's not I bring up- I called him out for that this year, this past year. Who? Let's and not- he, he uh, replied to me and said- Oh, yeah, we won both those elections, 2000 and 2020. Yeah. yeah. I'm proud of my work in overturning the fake counting of ballots in Florida in 2000. Well, I'm sorry, but you're wrong, Blue Gal, because I heard it from no less an authority than Matt Lewis and Charlie Sykes. That Matt Schlapp used to be a great guy. Wait a minute. Matt Lewis, the author of the quotable Sarah Palin? The very one. But let's not get ahead (laughs) of ourselves. Uh, (laughs) And also, uh, Charlie and Matt were commiserating over the the good old days when Rush Limbaugh was fun and irreverent and a real man of ideas. Uh, Look, there's one thing this week that really pissed me off, and it's uh, today in bad journalism. The Associated Press tweeted from their Associated Press Twitter account. Yeah. Democrats are ready to shove they use the word shove, Drift Glass. Right. Shove a $1.9 trillion Coronas relief package through the House today. But a minimum wage boost to $15 an hour is unlikely to be in the final version that reaches President Joe Biden. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. uh, you know, we're going to just shove it through, Drift Glass. No, yeah. we won the election. This, as, as Paul Krugman said last night of Rachel Maddow, this isn't a stimulus bill. This is a disaster relief bill. Yes. The country's economy is in disaster because of the coronavirus mm-hmm. shutting everything down. And this is have, a disaster relief bill. And there have been negotiations with the treason caucus. Yeah. And and a handful of of by well, handful, half a handful of Republicans did come over and say Look, we could get behind this if you just cut it like by two thirds or maybe yeah, more. Yeah, no, and, they wanted thirty percent. Uh, <laughs> just could you cut out all the shit that you like and sleeve the stuff that we like, and then I guess you're not going to do that. Oh well, and that was what they considered to be negotiation. But there was that some was negotiation. negotiation. They went to the White House and said, "Yeah, take it or leave it." Well, we're going to well, fine, go ahead and shove it through. We, and and you just know they they were they had held on to this faint hope that. Maybe Joe Biden doesn't remember the Obamacare right. negotiations. But he Maybe totally he, does. Oh, but he was there and he remembered yeah. how 
your negotiation was stalling and stalling and stalling and lying and lying and lying and running the clock out and then say, and, well, and adding 200 amendments, however, however many amendments, 50 amendments to it. And the ones that didn't get added were obvious poison pills that nobody in their right mind would add. And, and then after, Mitch McConnell stood in front of the bill and said, it's too big to yes, pass. It's too big. It's got too many pages. Yeah. And Chuck Grassley, when asked at, at towards the end, you guys aren't really going to vote for this, are you? And he said, nah, nah, we're just fucking with you. And now we won. Now we've won because we've, we've burned through your political capital and your honeymoon period. And we and have made we you made the sure bad guy. The jobs won't come back until after 2010. Right. And we so, made sure of that so that we would win the midterms. Yep. So our work here is done. And uh, apparently Joe Biden was taking notes and, and said, nope, 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 nope. This time we're, we're going to push this thing right along. You can get on board if you have good suggestions. And that was always Obama's you know, point. If you have a better idea, if you have a good suggestion that will reach the following goals, A, B, C, D, give them to me. We will put those in the law. I don't care. There's an outcome I want to achieve. Help mm-hmm. me achieve it. I'll put your goddamn mm-hmm. name on the bill. I don't care. And their, their priority was sabotage the black guy. Kneecap yep. the black guy, make him look bad, drive him out of office after one term so we can put our assholes back in the White House. And that's all these fuckers. They don't care if millions of people die. That's all they care about. And it's really hard for people to uh, understand how deeply evil the Republican Party is. Not misguided, not just stupid. They're evil people. And they 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 and they and they're sunk into it. They, there's no way for them to stop. I know we're going to talk about this article in the week, but before we do that, um, apparently today on CNN, Van Jones said that Biden will lose big in the midterms if all he can do is take out COVID and give stimulus. <laughs> you know, Roosevelt is not going to do well if all he's going to do is beat the Depression and beat the Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you, Van Jones. Yeah. I, you really, he really does want Donald Trump I don't know, to live in his pocket or something. It's very, very, very weird to hear that. All right. But this article uh, in The Week by Ryan Cooper is called The GOP's Apathy for Governing is Being Exposed. And I know he didn't write that passive uh, headline. No. <laughs> uh, but uh, this this was a good article um, about how, as we said at the very beginning of the podcast, Republican Party isn't interested in government or or governing. Uh, Ryan Cooper writes, for the bulk of the Republican caucus in Congress and the bulk of its voting base. And I'm so glad he brought up the voters. Me um, too. The, yeah. the federal government is a sort of postmodern semiotic signifier without any material referent. Politics is something that happens entirely on TV and Facebook. An eternal quest to symbolically own the libs by buying the politically correct things or breaking the politically incorrect things you have already bought or sticking your head in a plume of toxic smoke, (laughs) whatever. By this vote view, you vote for Trump not because he will do anything in particular for you, but because him taking office will make liberals cry. And we've said all of that so many times, but I really did love this sentence that he wrote that uh, I thought was a little drift glassy in. Um, (laughs) He said, one faction of Republicans would let the country burn if it benefited them politically. And another faction is so crazy, they don't believe in fire. Yeah. Yeah. And when you look at Marjorie Taylor Greene this week putting up you know, believe the science, there are two genders, male and female, a sign outside her office, which does no work except supporting her trolling. Well, and a sign specifically designed to mess with her colleague. Her colleague across who, the hall. Who has a, a trans daughter. Who has yes. a trans daughter. It's just, hey, guess what? I can I can dump dog shit in your yard and there's not a goddamn thing you can do about it because I was elected to Congress and that's my yeah. job. And. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She really does think that's her job. And you know yeah. what? The yeah. people who voted for her really do think that's her that's, job. And that's the issue that, that this article brought up, Brian Cooper's article in the week brought up, which is it's the voters that expect this too. Yeah. And so what happens, and and again, I, who knows what happens to these voters when they really need a shot, when they really need help with their heating bills, when they really need help 
from the government, from the federal government, do they just erase that and it's 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 not part of politics to cash that? Uh, we're calling it a stimulus check, but to, D- to take that their big deposit, the disaster yeah. relief. Yeah. Like I said, this should say Joe Biden is the duly elected president <laughs> of the United States and you sign that to take the money. This I, came from the federal government that is working for you to make your life better. I, I, and I guess all we can do is really continue to demonstrate that. AOC going to Texas, Beto being in Texas, saying this is what we do. I am so impressed with uh, the United Center in Chicago today. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you want to talk about that for just a sec? Well, they, what, gover- what government is doing in Chicago? Yeah, they're, they, they've converted the United Center into a virus, uh, into a vaccine center. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. they're giving shots to thousands of people. Uh, in it's going to be 6,000 old- shots a day yeah. starting March 8th, mm-hmm. which is in a week and a half. Uh-huh. Uh, they've, and they've started laying down the, the barriers and where you drive in. And they've uh, brought Uber on board to give free rides to people to come and get their shots if you don't have a car. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's remarkable. Uh, I, I and, told you. I and was- – when yeah. you sign up for the shot is when you can sign up for an Uber yeah. online. Yeah. It's coordinated. Uh, well, after Katrina, I told you, I've told the story before, I, I had a very small part in a very large effort to receive Katrina survivors mm-hmm. in Chicago. They were airlifting them out of there because the, the whole area was just ruined, just devastated. And so we got many, many, many plane loads of people who were walking off the planes in muddy clothes, just the mm-hmm. shirt, literally right. shirts on their back. And right. I saw the city of Chicago, the corrupt city of Chicago, the deeply troubled and et cetera city of Chicago, mobilize in a 24-hour period to convert the wrong building. And then at midnight, they figured out this building won't do. And then go all night to convert the right building and be re- prepared to receive hundreds of people the next day. Mm-hmm. It, with, it was, and with clothes and food and a place to stay yeah. and et cetera, et cetera. It was incredibly right. impressive. And and the people on the ground, the people who were there from every department in the city of Chicago doing what they do, um, who were just cranking it all day long. We can so do guys, things like that. You guys this. were just kind of, what, drafted into doing this or this was actually part of your job <laughs> all, or what? All hands on deck. Every department um, needs to, to, to put people – in a, a crisis group, and I, that was my, I was the guy from my department because it happened over a holiday weekend, and I was the only yeah. person there because mm-hmm. I worked insane hours. Yeah. Uh, so I took the call and I became the guy. And it was if you're the Department of Human Services, here's all the human services you'll provide. If it was if you're food, if you're fleet, if you're cops, if you're education, here there are kids coming out who need a place to stay and schools to go to. Oh wait, a um, place to go to school. And yeah. my department was specialized in people who are unemployed, workforce mm-hmm. development, and people who've had their entire employment history wiped out and oh, need wow. to recreate their resumes and recreate a whole a whole history for themselves and find temporary employment or find unemployment and do all the paperwork and shit like that. And you know, within a day and a half, it was running smoothly and I was just incredibly impressed. And when you're yeah. involved in something like that, even at a very low level, you realize, oh, shit, people working together under a government umbrella can really can do amazing the things. They can, can defeat, defeat the Nazis. They can defeat the Nazis. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And we can still defeat the Nazis. We certainly can. Even the ones from Illinois. <laughs> um, Illinois Nazis. I hate those guys. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I had to say it. Hey, uh, we got a letter from alert listener Chris in Brisbane, Australia. Oh, for heaven's sake. I know. Chris, you're going to love this week's internet pet. Um, he brought two items to our attention, and you said that we have time to ruminate over one of them. So mm-hmm. I will read the part, and then you respond to what he wrote. Is that okay? Uh, I think he actually summarizes it so well, I don't have to say a word, but we'll, okay, we'll see. Okay, good. We'll see. Yeah. Good. All right. Well, let's read what Chris wrote. He wrote about Morning Joe this week, had Frank Luntz and Mark Cuban lamenting over the state of the Republican Party (laughs) and the widespread acceptance by their voters of conspiracy theories and misinformation. And Frank Luntz put the onus squarely on Joe Biden for the good of the country to bring the Republicans back to their senses by being bipartisan. Oh, God. Shock and horror that there are no Republicans in Joe Biden's cabinet. Oh, no. 
Uh-huh. And treat them gently, said Frank Luntz. Slap them gently. <laughs> Chris writes, my thinking is, and I'm sure you see it this way as well, get stuffed. (laughs) Yeah. Since when was it the job of the Democrats to fix the problems with the Republican Party? Luntz didn't put the onus back on Republicans themselves to do anything. Cuban thought it was a good sign that Biden was not proposing any tax increases. I heard this part. Oh, yeah. my God. Yeah. It's just great that he's not raising my taxes on day one. You know, that shows bipartisan. If he was, that would confirm the fears that the Republicans always had about the incoming Biden administration. And now, since he isn't raising my taxes, says Mark Cuban, the right wingers can be reassured. See, there wasn't anything to be afraid of after all. Well, I think he did say it all. (laughs) He did. He did. And, you know, Chris, first of all, you're in Brisbane, Australia. So what the hell are you doing watching Morning Joe? You've got better (laughs) things to do with your life in the lovely country you live in than wade through our toxic mess. But I do appreciate it. Um, I didn't see it, but you've described it accurately. This is exactly who Frank Luntz is. Frank Luntz is all Frank Luntz is a is a parasite. He's, He's been he's been attached to the Republican Party, feeding it poison moving in the, in the direction of crazy for 30 years. It doesn't surprise me that his initial impulse is that somehow Democrats are responsible for coddling Republicans and leading and them back And fixing the Marjorie Taylor Greene right. problem, right? Because right. Right? That's, what, that's what they convinced Barack Obama that it was his job yeah. to do. Um, yeah. You know, yeah, we know they're crazy, but you know, go gentle on it, be easy, you know, break the fever. And the fever is never going to break. But if Frank Luntz is willing to acknowledge, is willing to say publicly, the reason that Democrats need to fix this is because Republican voters, they're completely irresponsible. I don't know what the fuck they're doing. We'd be happy to take care of them and make sure they have good schools and good health care and clean air and clean water, but they can't vote anymore. They can't right. participate in the democracy anymore because what you are saying is they're so reckless or so deranged or so brainwashed that they can't function as a citizen anymore. So they well, need to be and they t- have to keep losing until they get bored with losing. Well, but that's and- not then, – then you're not being gentle with them, Blue Gal. <laughs> then you're not being gentle with them. See, that's that's the trap. Yeah, um, yeah. No, the answer to – We've had this conversation before, Drift with They have to have 50% of the time right. on the air, right? Or uh, it's not always. fair. Well, and, and I, would, I would direct your attention to a lovely post today – by the redoubtable Digby, who we have oh, mentioned yeah. once yeah. before on this thing. And she wrote a lovely post about what bipartisanship was king. And it's a joke because it's about the history of the Senate parliamentarian. Mm-hmm. And, and let's remind everyone, the Senate parliamentarian this week decided that the $15 minimum wage increase cannot go in the COVID bill. It cannot be part of budget oh, reconciliation. Because I say so. And and yeah. that's that's the referee. That's That's their job. And that's fine. Um, And she points out the fact that in 2001, the GOP fired the Senate parliamentarian over reconciliation in a 50-50 Senate. And it was such a non-scandal, the New York Times put it on page uh, page 22. 22. Um, C-SPAN didn't cover it. The actual parliamentarian himself 10 years later said, you know, various parliamentarians get fired when the majority leader gets mad. Um, But the point being that... These were the glory days of bipartisanship. Bipartisanship. These were the good yet, old days. As someone, as someone said on Twitter, you know, why does it take 60 votes for Democrats to do anything and only 50 mm-hmm. for Republicans to get everything they want? Well, because it's baked into – it used to be – I'm hoping this has changed. It used to be baked into the psyche of the mainstream media by repetition. Mm-hmm. And a whole bunch of Democrats. Well, you know, this is really a center right country, Blue Cow. Yeah. So it takes 50, 60 votes to get anything done in the when, Senate. When, you know when that, it's 50, right? 50 50, uh, Republicans should have their way because we're basically a center right country. No, we're not. We're a center left country. We're, we're a, a whole lot left more country. left than anybody wants to admit we are. And yep. the idea that, well, it's okay for Republicans to to fire the parliamentarian where, when there's a tie and it never gets mentioned and it's never a scandal because, well, Republicans just get to do that. But right. Democrats, well, they're they're trying to assert themselves. They're trying to be bold. They're trying to they're trying to they're govern shoving this place. This bill through drift glass. Yeah, yeah. Associated exactly. Press said so. I I, read I it. want it. I want everyone to know how proud I am of my husband. By the way, what did I do? I'm proud of him for a lot of reasons. What did I do? Uh, 
What did I forget? Well, what there's two things. Two things. One is, and I'm not going to get into any of the details, we had a little bit of a financial hit this week. It's so we're going to be okay. Uh-huh. But um, Drift Glass didn't get mad about it at all. And he just took it in stride and yeah. hugged me and we dealt with it and we're dealing with it. And it's like, okay. It's going to be fine. And that is... I have to tell you what a contrast that is to other parts of my life. Mm-hmm. I'm very grateful that I'm married to the person I am. And that's all I'm going to say about that. Uh, I love you. We'll be married 10 years this August and yeah. I will marry you all over again. Same that's, year, baby. That's all I have to say. Uh, second thing is drift glass in our notes for the podcast. He has an item about David Brooks and it is three sentences long, three short sentences. Three long. short sentences. I'm learning. And I'm so now. proud of well, you Lent. for that. It's Lent. So I'm giving up 90% <laughs> of David Brooks for Lent. Well, I remember years where you just gave up writing about David Brooks altogether for Lent. I did. I did. And I was a better <laughs> man for it. Uh, yes. This year I'm giving up Twitter for Lent. Twitter for uh, Lent. Right yes, now. you are. <laughs> Might as well make it a virtue, right? Right. Um, right. Yeah. Here's three sentences. David Brooks wrote a thing. I think it was an attempt at satire. It crashed and burned hard. Yeah, That's and you wrote about it, I and did. it's at your blog. So driftglass.blogspot.com, you can go read about it. I hey, wrote a bunch of stuff this week. Happy birthday to youngest child who's leaving for work right now. Bye. Not work. Oh. Okay, bye. Oh, see you later. She blew me a kiss. Oh. She's going to see a friend of hers, and uh, they're all in this bubble. So it, I'm I'm perfectly fine with it. Yeah. She she uh, said, "I'm leaving forever. Goodbye, mother." Yeah, and I'll see she, you on Sunday. <laughs> see, yeah, see you on the other side. But she turned seventeen. Yeah, today. 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 And Very uh, we're proud of her. Yes. Uh, all right, let's do a news roundup, shall we? Okay. Sure. The House passed the Equality Act, which would amend the Civil Rights Act of 1964 by extending civil rights protections to. Prohibit discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation or gender identity, which is did just, Rodney Davis vote yes on that bill? I have no, no idea. No, he did not. I have no. I'm guessing if I had to. No, guess, he did not. If I had three to put Republicans house money, crossed over, and Rodney Davis was not one of them. Oh, yeah. Trump's tax returns and other financial documents were turned over to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office this week. <laughs> All right. Uh, now this is this is a sad news, and you all know about it. Uh, flags are flying at half mast all over Springfield. And probably all over the country because the U.S. death toll from coronavirus topped half a million, more than 28 million confirmed cases. In the United States. In the United States. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> the Bidening continues, Drift Glass. Biden ended Trump's ban on, Ill- on legal immigration that had dramatically cut legal immigration to the U.S. during the coronavirus pandemic. Mm-hmm. The Biden administration will make 25 million masks available for free to Americans at community health centers and food banks. Biden altered the payroll protection program to direct more funding towards very small businesses and those owned by minorities or located in underserved communities. Starting March 9th, businesses with more than 20 employees will be shut out of the PPP for two weeks. Uh, Biden criticized the PPP's early rollout for privileging larger businesses with existing banking connections while smaller businesses struggled to obtain relief. Yeah. Biden affirmed that the United States is fully committed to NATO, but warned global leaders that democratic progress is under assault. And this last one went under the radar, but it's so sort of exactly what government should do. Mm -hmm. Um, Biden has ordered a top to bottom review of the U.S. supply chain for vital goods. Mm -hmm. Where we get food, where we get masks, where we get medical supplies, where we get computer parts um things that if they stop ventilators working, you mean stuff yeah. like ventilators like ventilators yeah. things that if yeah. they are cut off for whatever reason we're screwed i mean you know globalization mm-hmm. is a fact but the idea that our vital goods can be cut off by someone else someone other than us and mm-hmm. hold us hostage to that is something that shouldn't be um shouldn't be tolerated there was a tweet this morning about a domino's pizza in san antonio texas that had enough food for to make pizzas for an average from Friday to Monday morning. And all of the food in the Domino's pizza was gone in four hours. Yeah. Because they did they don't groceries, they don't, you know, everybody ordered pizza. And here were these two employees having worked a four hour shift in which all of their food was used. Mm-hmm. And the tweet was pointing out these folks made, you know, forty bucks. Yeah. In the 
in the four hours they worked. Well, but but John Thune thinks they should have enough money based on that to buy an apartment and go to right. college and right. buy, buy a car. Who knows? Right. You know, because those are good jobs, right. little gal. Right. Um, right. According to acting U.S. Capitol Police Chief, uh, I'm going to mispronounce this, but I'm going to go at it, Yogananda Pittman, mm -hmm. uh, he warned that the same groups involved in the January 6th insurrection want to, quote, blow up the Capitol and, quote, kill as many members as possible, unquote, during Biden's first official address to Congress. Yeah, this was a uh, she. Uh, Yogananda is a woman. And mm -hmm. uh, they this is the. Here's the thing. Everybody yesterday that um, that uh, designated survivor show, the Kiefer Sutherland show, uh -huh. was trending because this is their fantasy to blow up the Capitol during the State of the Union. And episode one of designated survivor, that's what happens. Mm -hmm. And I, no one else remembered that 24 was a Kiefer Sutherland show right. Right. where Dick Cheney and his goons jacked off. Sorry to fantasies about torturing people to save democracy. Mm -hmm. And maybe Kiefer Sutherland needs to go make some hippie shows <laughs> where I'd he just be... smoke pot and, you know, smell some daisies and get along with everybody and maybe open up a, a animal sanctuary or yeah. something. Isn't there a Dark City sequel that you could be doing right now, <laughs> Kiefer Sutherland? <laughs> something with no connection to Washington or reality At or all. politics or anything. At all. <laughs> All right. Uh, the U.S. Capitol Police suspended six officers with pay for their actions, d for their actions. Let me say that again, for their actions during the January 6th riot at the Capitol. Another 29 are under investigation. Yeah. The, the, the presence of insurrection sympathizers in the military mm -hmm. and the police. And it, white nationalists in the police nationwide which we've is known a problem. About, which we've known yeah. about for decades. Yeah. Um, you know, where do you think Tim McVeigh got his skills and his ideology? Um, Rick Scott, you know Rick Scott. He's a mm -hmm. senator from the state of Florida. Uh, he circulated a memo declaring that the Republican Civil War is canceled. Uh, in a two-page letter that was obtained by Fox News, Scott, the chairman of the National Republican Senate Committee, uh, declared the GOP Civil War to be over. And here are some quotes from what he said. The Republican Civil War is now canceled. The long-running impeachment show is now over. This political theater should have been held the other end of Washington, in like the Kennedy Center, instead of the U.S. Capitol. It was an unserious circus. It's over. Now it's time to look ahead. And finally, the hour is late. The Democrats are planning to destroy our freedoms. And the, the, and the threat in front of us is very real. The um, amount of gaslighting that has gone on this week about January 6th, something we all watched on television and was actually happened, and people pretending, no, they were just walking in as tourists. It didn't really happen. False flag. Reading right-wing blog posts into the Senate record. Well, and, and take this one sentence. The Democrats are planning to destroy our freedoms. Go back to any fucking CPAC in the last 25 mm -hmm. years, and you'll find mm -hmm. exactly this sentiment. This is not a new thing. This is the Republican Party that we on the outside, who have been suffering under it, who have been warning about it for decades, have been seeing all along. They really do think, they've now convinced millions of Americans that you and I, Blue Gal, are the enemy, not the yeah. opposition, not a difference of opinion. We, you and I, are an existential threat to this country who must be destroyed at any cost. And that's what we saw on January 6th, the manifestation of that. Right, the, the, right. And, if you keep and, up that rhetoric, what are you going to get? And they won't back off from it because, as we've said before in this podcast, this is all they have. And it works. It works. It gets the primary voters out. Yes. It does. U.S. intelligent report confirms that Saudi Arabia's Crown Prince Bonesaw, was Mohammed bin Salman, was responsible for approving the murder of U.S.-based journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Trump lied about that. So did Jared for yep. money. For money. Lied about it for money. And Steve Mnuchin, oh, please. That's a. He's going to start a. He's starting an investment fund. With these guys' money. Isn't with the that, Saudis, yeah. Isn't that convenient? Uh, Rachel Maddow did a whole thing on it. The last trip he made abroad before they kicked him out of office was to all of these wealthy Middle Eastern countries that he had been sucking up to for the four years, including and he, he cut Saudi back, Arabia. though, his visit to Saudi Arabia from two cities to one because January 6th happened and yeah. he had to get back, you know. Speaking of that, Trump will speak at this week's Conservative Political Action Committee, his first public appearance since leaving office. 
He reportedly intends, this has come as a shock, I know, sit down, put a damp cloth over your eyes, uh, to attack Biden's immigration plan and tell attendees that he is Republicans' presumptive 2024 nominee for president. Of course. Keep talking, Sparky. Yeah, yeah. That's what I have to say. Just keep on talking. I want to run against Trump in 2022. Palm Beach County refused to lower the flags to half staff in quote unquote honor of Rush Limbaugh. <laughs> now, I don't approve of the plan to raise the flagpoles so that they could eat, fly the flag even higher because that would be disrespectful <laughs> and wrong. But, you know, just just not doing it at all, I think, is, is the middle ground. It's the appropriate middle position. Uh, Queen Elizabeth II, ever heard of her, said on Thursday that her coronavirus jab didn't hurt at all and urged those wary of receiving the vaccine to think about other people. God bless the queen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying that as Johnny Rotten, but no. yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, Ted Cruz may be buying his own books through a mystery company to boost sales records. Yeah. So if you get a Christmas present from Ted Cruz, you know what it's going to be. <laughs> um, the... Uh, Oh, we've already talked about the Senate parliamentarian. I will add one last thing. The the, the program WandaVision is very good. Uh, and maybe the subject... It took us a while to get into it. It did. But... The first episode was hard to get past because I couldn't tell where they were going. Like, oh, really? We're going to do this? But it got good. It stayed good. And it might be the subject of, who knows, a future science fiction university program. We're talking about it. Yeah. And we've got one we've, got one we're going to work on, I hope, this weekend. We are. And um, I'll just... It, Working title is While You Were Sleeping. Yep. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, in local news, our home state of Illinois became the first state in the union to end cash bail statewide. Yeah. Illinois does a lot Very of things proud. wrong. Very proud. But they did this one dead right. Uh, future trivia answer, Edward Guerra Kodat, was handpicked by disgraced former Illinois House Speaker Mike Madigan. Three days later, Kodat abrupt, abruptly resigned in light of, and I love this, quote, unspecified alleged questionable conduct, uh, which were, <laughs> I know, I know. It's just like some writer had a lot of fun putting that. Well, unspecified that alleged questionable conduct. Yeah, yeah, but it was enough to make him resign three days after he got the job. So yeah, he quit. Yeah. So no one would met, would be able to know how specified. Yeah. Please don't the specify. conviction. I'll leave. <laughs> Which and raises, unquestionably conduct that he did. Yes. Well, and, so you have to ask yourself, is there anyone in Mike Madigan's inner circle who is not a crook? No, 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 there isn't. There isn't. Each week we post to our Facebook page and website an Internet Kitty sent in by you, the listeners. This week's Internet Kitty, we usually don't do animals in the news, but, you know, you know who I am and you know what I do. You know I'm a knitter <laughs> and you know I love sheep. And this animal in the news named Barack who lost 78 pounds of fleece. He had gotten loose and hadn't had a shearing for a few years Yep, and couldn't see and was carrying around 78 pounds of fleece on his back and had to be sh shorn. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. 16 bags full. <laughs> you called him, he's called Barack, Barack. Uh -huh. And you called him Barack Hussein, the Australian you sheeper. That's I did. very funny. I did because, you know. Um, he now lives at the Edgar's Mission Farm Sanctuary. Their website is edgarsmission.org.au. And uh, I don't know what they're going to do with that fleece. They should auction off that fleece. They should. They should. I'm telling you, the, the fleece, first of all, it's a merino ram, um, which means it's very high quality wool. And the wool nearest to his skin where, that they shorn off is incredibly soft and incredibly high quality. And I hope they do something to give that away or do something to fundraise for their nonprofit, because it is a nonprofit where now Barack lives and does the nom 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 with his dinner and is seems to be doing just fine. I, I know of a place where there's several hundred people lining up to be fleeced, but that would be Florida. <laughs> and that's this that would be weekend. CPAC. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, you know, Barack the sheep is uh, eating a lot of freshly poured sheep food. Yeah, just saying. Our fake sponsor, whether you serve pet store perfection or dollar store dreck, your sheep or pets or other animals will sit on the barn floor and demand that the food they eat is only freshly poured. Freshly poured, freshly poured. Oh, my Lord, it's freshly poured. And you can visit Barack at our Facebook page or website. 
And you can send your internet kitty or other pet to us at our email address, proleftpodcast at gmail.com, or you can also write to both of us. Feel free to write us. We love hearing from you. Be aware that if you write us at any of our addresses, we reserve the right to read your email or U.S. Postal Service. Go Postal Unions! Letter on the air unless you say otherwise. Hashtag save the post office. Don't forget our gourmet coffee guideline. If you can afford to buy an espresso-based beverage for yourself, buy one for us. This is not charity. This is our job. And it's a labor of love. Hey, Driftglass, how do you feel about bribes? I'm in favor of them, especially now if you've noticed, Blue Gal, we have a letter from Brisbane. We have a mm-hmm. sheep from Australia. And yeah. we have our freshly poured cat food now available internationally. So See? we're going big. <laughs> And you don't get that way by by doing good work. You get that way by bribing people. So, oh, I see. Yeah. Well, we we received a letter from someone that had cash in the envelope asking us to mention Sophie the Flying Pug. Well, so I, it I done. think we have to have a staff meeting about whether or not we mention Sophie the Flying Pug. Was this Sophie and, the Flying Pug we're talking about? Yeah. I, okay. What do you think yeah. about t- mentioning Sophie the Flying Pug well, in exchange for cash in an envelope? We usually have our pug meetings on Thursdays. <laughs> But in this case, I'm willing to bump it up to a Friday on the podcast if it means money for us. So Sophie yeah. the Flying Pug will have to be tabled until a future show. Sorry, Sorry about that. Approximately 1% of our listeners support this podcast with a contribution, and you can too. See our website, proleftpod.com, for details. Both our PayPal and postal address information is there at proleftpod.com. Please share our show on social media, and thank you so much for doing that. Hey, Drift Glass, how are the Internet Kitties doing this week? The Internet Kitties think it's obvious that Agnes's unseen husband, Ralph, on WandaVision is really Raphael Ted Cruz. Freedom! Let's think about living. Let's think about loving. Let's think about the hooping and the hopping and the bopping and the loving, loving, dubbing. Let's forget about the whining and the crying and the shooting and the dying and the fellow with a switchblade knife. Let's think about living. Let's think about life. The Professional F Podcast is recorded under a Creative Commons license. Copyright 2021 DGBG Productions.